Hi there, I'm Claire McDonnell Liu and this is the Family Health Lab. In today's conversation, I'm talking keto diets with world renowned ketogenic diet expert Beth Zupakania. Beth is going to be sharing her wealth of knowledge of treating epilepsy in children and adults, neurological conditions, and metabolic health conditions with keto. She's going to be sharing her tips on making your diet success and avoiding adverse effects. You're listening to the Family Health Lab. Healthy parents, healthy kids. Hi there, Beth. Thank you very much for jumping on this call with me uh, to talk about ketogenic diets, all things keto. You're welcome. You have a phenomenal um, breadth of experience in the keto field over 30 years as a clinical dietitian working with the Charlie's Foundation. Are you an author? You've created the keto calculator. It just, your list of keto related achievements just goes on. It's amazing. I'm wondering, I'm really curious to know, um, because keto has not been a widely accepted or loved field. Um, what, what drives you? What, what do you love about or what, um, what interests you in keto diets? You know, it's, it works for nearly everybody who I work with. And that is not the case with most diets. It's truly an amazing therapy. And I have to say that I've been working with it long enough to know the ins and outs of all the variations of keto. So it's it's key to find the one that works best. And individualizing a ketogenic therapy really is what I think is key to making it work and, and uh, matching it to the person's needs and their culture and their medical need. Um, you know, what I do for somebody with epilepsy is really quite different than what I do for somebody who has autism or cancer or migraine headaches. Okay, that, that makes sense. And I think that's an important fact that's coming out more and more with, with um, had a history of ketogenic diet for childhood epilepsy and really making progress now with the, um, keto for adults with epilepsy. But you're mentioning a wide variety of conditions that you've got experience working with. And that, that's, um, that's across neurological and metabolic health conditions and, and epilepsy, um, and different, different specific epilepsy conditions. So your approach is different with, with, with a different person, different circumstances and different health condition. So can you give me an example of how you might vary um, the diet, the approach, perhaps taking autism? I know you've done a little bit of work or some, some work with autism. And um, what, what would the approach there be? Yes. Yeah, so let's say a child with autism, and I've worked with many, um, uh, is, is a candidate for keto and so I would first find out what they are currently eating because often children, especially with autism, have very particular likes and dislikes and they're eating a very small variety of food. So when I uh, get them going on keto, I work with their parent or caregiver to kind of match the foods that they're currently accepting and make them work into a ketogenic therapy and it might be a fairly high carbohydrate ketogenic therapy and I'm going to throw out a ratio because we use these terms. Um, it might be a one to one ketogenic ratio meaning for every gram of fat there's a gram of protein and carbohydrate and this is like the most liberal version of keto where there's actually you know 30 or 40 grams of carbohydrate in a day and plenty of protein and plenty of fat but not the 90% fat, it might be 70% fat, well, which doesn't seem like a huge difference when you talk about those big numbers, but it actually is when you're putting food on a plate. So, so that's a good example of using a very liberal ketogenic diet with the intention of getting the child first to tolerate it and to eat it regularly. And then once that happens, we can make adjustments if we see that it's helping and the family wants to try to go maybe a little deeper in ketosis to see if there's more benefit. And I have to say with every child that I've worked with who has autism, there has been some degree of benefit. And between some degree and, and in one case, and a child that I worked with years ago, she's 
completely off her spectrum. She's no longer diagnosed as having autism. Um, her mom happened to be a medical doctor and a pediatrician, so she was very, um, uh, very determined to make it work the best way possible. And the mom's mom was a dietitian, so they had like the best team for this little girl. And um, so now this this pediatrician offers a keto therapy to many of her patients with autism, and she only works with kids that have autism. So she's specialized in this. But yeah, that that actually that case was written up in a medical journal, um, and the details of it are available. And I'd be happy to send it to you if your readers are interested in seeing that. Absolutely, I'd love to read that. I um, work as a nutritionist and work with families on improving their health and. Um, getting in better shape and just feeling better. And I've noticed with um, children with ADHD type behaviours and autism type behaviours, a massive, massive um, improvements in mood, energy, and um, really reduced um, autism type type behaviours. Um, and then years ago, worked in a special needs school and saw massive, massive differences, not on a catch and it diet, but um, on a um, higher nutrient dense intake, lower carb by default, um, with protein, and everything. So, uh, but also reading about your work with epilepsy over years, lots of, um, children going in to manage their epilepsy. They had behavior, so they had ben benefits for behavior, mood and energy, um, sleep, et cetera, et cetera, and, and autism behaviors for, for, for years. So, so this, it's good that this work is, is going on. And, um, I'd be very, very interested to read, read that, that particular case and, and also that, that, um, that GP, that medical uh, professional's work. That would be really good. Um, so, so families with autism, this is, this is something that they're perhaps they would struggle perhaps to get in to see somebody professionally in, in a, in a clinic unless they had another condition. Is, is that right? The access at the moment isn't, isn't great for them. Yes, exactly. Uh, so the children, most of the children that I worked with who had autism also had epilepsy. So they came for the epilepsy, but the autism got better. And then we started to realize, oh my goodness, you know, we see kids that don't have autism, but have epilepsy and their cognition gets better. It seems like across the board, we see this improvement in energy, improvement in cognition, better sleep, you know, and then, you know, when I went out in the world, into my own practice and started working with older patients, adults and elderly patients, see the same thing. So um, I, I do want to link back to what I started out by saying, and that with all these conditions, there will eventually be guidelines. There's currently consensus guidelines, and that means a lot of experts who've been working with the diet for many, many years got together, and they weren't paid for this, they got together and uh, created a guideline. And sometimes they voted on some of the guidelines because there isn't a well done study to, to describe certain parts of, of a diet, like fluids, like do you, you restrict or do you not restrict? So we agree with the consensus, 100% of us agree you don't have to restrict, that you have to provide sufficient fluids. So there's those kinds of components of the guidelines, but we now have guidelines for children with epilepsy, adults with epilepsy, and I was involved with both of those. There is now guidelines for keto for people with uh, migraine headache. And there's guidelines for, for people with uh, um, GLUT1 deficiency syndrome, which is a rare genetic metabolic syndrome where epilepsy is often a characteristic. And I think think in the near future, there, there's going to be a consensus guideline for people with depression. Uh, because you mentioned you had interviewed Jan Bazuki, and she is moving the effort forward to get professionals involved in, um, you know, getting information out there and getting people safely onto keto that need this type of therapy. That's amazing. I hadn't realized how far we'd come with the, the, on the mental health, the depression side. Um, you've been working in this field, as I said, for uh, uh, over 30 years. And, um, it's been initially prim primarily with epilepsy. And now, um, it's become 
this long forgotten diet that was referred to by Hippocrates and then um, 1920s, it was in use with adults. But we've seen professionals like yourself have a long, hard, slow, steady slog to, to elevate this and demonstrate the effectiveness of, of this. So, I mean, I really appreciate you. Our, our family have, um, very much benefited from your work and the Charlie Foundations and Emma Williams work, Matthew's friends. Um, so, I, so it is really, I think it's exciting. So are you, are you very, very hopeful, um, for these changes that are coming out with this new funding and all of these new, new potential areas? Very hopeful. And it's so exciting to be involved in this because we can all, we all contribute to this momentum of energy. And um, it's not that it's getting easier because we still are seeing that the, these therapies, even when there are consensus, consensus guidelines, excuse me, they're still not well utilized. They're still highly underutilized. And unfortunately, that has to do with the fact that they're not very profitable. Um, but, you know, it, the more we can get people on board, people trained, and that's something else that I do. I train other nutritionists on how to implement therapies for many disorders. The more people we can do that, and, and there'll be people like me that like they can see it makes a huge difference. And they feel like, oh my gosh, I got to spend more time doing this because this is getting somebody some solutions where these other diets I've been doing really don't you know, people don't stick with them, like weight loss, the typical weight loss diet, for example. Um, so I think there is momentum. I think it just is taking forever. And you mentioned uh, the 1920s. Yes, it was um, discovered or described in the 1920s for children and adults. And uh, the diet really has not changed that much in terms of how we create it for epilepsy, the classic ketogenic diet. And we, we've been able to liberalize it over the years because of how often we see people can uh, use the more liberal diets and still do well. But that's over 100 years ago. And we're still talking about this as though it's something very fringe, right? <laughs> and it's not fringe. It's established, proven therapy. There's six randomized controlled trials showing its effectiveness in epilepsy. You know, drugs don't have that much evidence. And a lot of the adult drugs that are being used on children with epilepsy have never been in a randomized controlled trial. So we, you know, we can get into the, the uh, boxing ring and talking about how terrible this is, that this is not available, um, but we have to kind of emphasize the positive. And uh, I, I just, I'm so impressed with how parents do not give up. They want the best care for their children and they get on the internet and they find resources. And this is generally how at least half of the people that I've worked with have been able to find the therapy. They find it on their own. It's not that their doctor has told them about it. I think that's a, a, a really sad statistic. That was our experience. We found this ourselves. Um, and it was a, yeah, it, it was interesting to us. We did the research, we had a look and, and that's not unique that we then brought it to our team who had been telling us about the medications, but not the alternatives. And then I'm talking to other um, families uh, in the epilepsy communities and they're offered surgery first before diet. Um, so, so multiple different types of meds and then surgery. But, but, um, so it is interesting, but I'm like you. I like to stay on the positive side and do what we can do to raise awareness of it as a really viable option and powerful. And I think calling it a diet sometimes really just kind of plays down the, the massive, massive potential. It's, I mean, it's a, I've heard you say in, um, in different talks that you have given that you, that this is a medical treatment. It's, it's, it should be raised and kind of talked about at the level of the medication is you're on that, that that's going to be managing whichever condition, whether it's an epilepsy or seizure condition or whether it's a neurological condition, mental health condition. This is, this is, um, this is medical treatment. And it, that's how you prefer it to be viewed, isn't it? Rather than just simply in the, in the diet bracket. Yes. You said it so well. It is that level of uh, treatment and 
respect should be respected as such, not only by the professionals, but also the patient, because we have a lot of people that are putting themselves on it, unfortunately, because they, they can't find somebody to, to help them. So I have to say a lot of the clients that come to me have put themselves on it and have failed or had a terrible adverse effect. And then they find me and I'm able to kind of put them back on track and Oftentimes, these people see initial results, like they feel better initially, and then things start going south, you know, at about two or three months in, and then they want to just give up, but they they realize that something was better. Um, I, I want to go back again to the consensus guidelines and point out that for epilepsy, we clearly state as a consensus of the 100% of all of the authors agreed that for epilepsy, after two medications have failed, this is when you should consider ketogenic therapy because the statistics show that if you try another medication, it's less likely to work. And every medication after that has a lower possibility of working. So stop trying the medications because they give the medications months sometimes, right, to see if they work and they adjust the levels. Start thinking about medications after the second one has not helped. Um, and, you know, that's not done. That's also not done, even though it's in the guidelines, it's still not in practice uh, as in real time. I think that's a massively important point to make. We've already got that consensus statement. That's for America, but um, I believe the, the, um, the UK have got similar guidelines. And um that's really interesting that, that another medication will be added. When we know the efficacy of those medications, it can reduce to around, you, you, you know, really low percentage chance of, of it doing anything for you. And then, of course, they come with adverse reactions. So then it gets back down to why we're not getting it, why it's not coming across. From my own parent perspective in, in a clinic, I felt that um, apart from the funding and the training, which... um I think uh, you're making a huge inroads in. I think it's also lack of confidence. If you're uh, dealing with a team, you've got very, very sick um, patients coming to you. Um, it's so, it's, it, it, you know, you've got confidence in medication, take that, and then you're dealt with. Whereas if you yourself haven't been trained in the diet, you, you don't ha know how to answer all of those complex questions um, and support them. Uh, and you've got limited resources. It's just so much easier to keep going on your default path. So I suppose it's um, it's complex, um, but I did feel that um, some of the people leading the keto clinics that I was involved with or visiting as as a patient supporter, um, the the confidence in their own ability and their own knowledge as the medical team wasn't wasn't there, which is where your long term work has come in. You've trained thousands, haven't you, of, of um, dietitians, but and um, other other. Um, um, professionals around the world. And now you've got your online training that, that, um, clinicians, registered clinicians can access. That's right. Yes. Uh, and it does take time for, to build up confidence. I didn't feel comfortable until I saw about 15 patients. So imagine what number one through 14 felt like, <laughs> you know, I, and I could tell they knew I was nervous. They were telling me, it doesn't say this in the, in the Johns Hopkins book. And I would have to go back to the book and read about what they saw. Um, so it takes a while, but that's true. That's true in any field of medicine that, you know, you're as good as your experience. And hopefully you're in a place where somebody has a little bit more experience, you know, teaching the new nutritionists because they, people retire or have babies and leave or whatever, get married and go away. Um, but uh, yeah, the Charlie Foundation and Matthew's friends have helped to fill some of that gap by providing so many resources on their websites. And, um, you know, the Charlie Foundation, I know Matthew's friends does too. They have a contact us where people can write in and ask questions and say, you know, I, I'm having this issue. I don't have a doctor. Um, do you know of anybody that I can work with? And the foundation also has a list of uh, trained nutritionists who work globally and for many disorders, not just epilepsy. Um, and we also have a, a hospital list. It, it's not a complete list, but we do have quite a few foreign hospitals listed. Um, 
and and then we have education materials and recipes and the recipes are the most visited part of the website because you know that's that's the most practical piece of the diet is finding out what you can eat to make the diet uh, to taste good and so that you can stay on it for a longer period of time and your readers and, and listeners need to know that um, sometimes the diet is temporary. You know, we use it short term for most children. They're only on it for a couple years, maybe three years. Um, and uh, some very few percent, a small percent are on it longer. But if they are on it longer, it tends to be much more liberal. Uh, liberal and usually they're so used to it by that time that they don't want to eat high carb, right? Um, I've seen that. And then adults who are on it generally are on it longer term because their body's not growing anymore and, and it takes a long time to undo whatever condition they have, you know, if they have diabetes or if they have insulin resistance. It takes, you know, some few years to get those really settled down. And so they might be on it, but they may also be able to liberalize over time. And so the goal is always to work with people to find out what can they live with and be comfortable with because at the end of the day, food is, is something that we love to have three times a day, right? And we want people to feel joyful about eating. We want them to eat with their family and not eat by themselves and feel that they're deprived all the time. Um, and, and that's what I, lo I love most about my job is making them feel like, I am eating this way because it makes me much better and I'm going to live a higher quality life. And so I'm going to put some work into this. I'm not going to just let this slide. I'm, I'm really going to commit myself to it. Um, I love that be because I think we're talking about a diet and we're talking macros and micronutrients and getting it right and getting the, getting the formula, um, the MCT oils and the fats and the, I think it can sound <laughs> uh complex um overly um uh difficult but also off putting you know food is a comfort food is a joy food is social um you know i as a as a parent of a child thinking of our child going on this diet you know i i had to take a very very deep breath and think this through because of those issues that you've mentioned and you want your child to feel comfortable be uh, you know um accepted and be um, able to enjoy all of those traditional things and activities and outings and go to school and have a normal looking lunchbox. And, um, I think very much the work that you've done and with Matthew's friends and, and with those patients, uh, I'm sorry, not with Matthew's friends, with the Charlie Foundation putting those recipes together. That really does give people that option, um, to enjoy their food and their food look normal and their food taste good. Um, so it is tasty. I, I do think that point should really, really come across. I think it, um, I was listening to um, a talk between you and um, Denise Potter and um, Matt Bazuki, and Matt Bazuki said something quite interesting. Um, and he's been on the Ketchin It Diet, he's still on the Ketchin It Diet for um, bipolar mental health. Um, he was he was almost making it into a game and finding ways to get pleasure out of um, increasing his fat and doing it in a really, actually, I think he used the term making it fun. And I like that. I thought, yeah, because it can be, can't it? Um, and, and, and making it, you, back to a comment that you said earlier, um, fitting it around the family. As a nutritionist, people come to me sometimes and say, give me a meal plan, you know, and I'll walk away with that. And it's, you know, off the shelf. And it's like, well, it's, that's fine. But, what works much, much better in terms of you enjoying it, you adhering to it and making it a success. But also, if you want an impact for your health, sticking with it long term is, you know, let's talk about what you like to eat, what you already eat. Let's work from that platform, that base, and let's make that food better versions, that better versions as in um, healthier versions that, that will suit you and work for you. So I really like your approach. Yeah. And I'll take that one step further because the other thing I do with food and, and getting people to acclimate to keto slowly is I'll say, hey, let's just work on breakfast this week. We're just going to talk about breakfast, eat whatever you want the rest of the day. But we're just going to talk about changing over your breakfast meals and getting you off of the Pop-Tarts and, um, and the packaged 
uh, muffins and things or the, the Starbucks. So let's just work on breakfast. And knowing that that itself is a huge change for somebody, not only getting those foods available to them, but the emotional change because they grieve not being able to go into Starbucks or wherever they go, get in, you know, get in line and use their app and all that. That's all very an emotional change that they have to go through. So you have to give people time and allow them to get through that. And then I say, when you're ready, we'll go and start working on dinner or your lunch meal. Um, but I think for adults, we adults aren't children. Children are much quicker to adapt because they don't have that history of habits yet. And so they're much easier to kind of manage um, from from an adult's perspective. Um, but yeah, the, the whole food thing is, is very sensitive and... Um, and I quite like it too. And I just want to say about Matt, he started off with a very structured keto diet, which I tend to do with adults, especially, like I said, most adults come to me and they're already trying to do keto based on the knowledge they found on their own and they aren't doing well. So I'll say, listen, it's not intuitive to do keto. I'm not even a nutritionist can put these macros on a plate saying that, you know, this is edible. So let's start off kind of structured using the foods that I know you like and start off with just breakfast. And then it's going to become intuitive. You're going to be able to figure it out on the fly and you're not going to need to measure your food or weigh your food or even use meal plans. It's going to be like this, you know, just like you used to know what to eat for breakfast because you were on an intuitive high carb plan, right? So once I start talking about those practical, you know, elements of diet change, then people open up and feel like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that, you know, I had all these feelings about food and I didn't realize there were all these different ways to look at it and to make changes and to, you know, give myself a breather and, and treat myself well in other ways, like spend the money that I would at Starbucks on something else that I like for my car or a trip or something. So talking about those things really, you know, gets people to relax and once, you know, gets them excited about doing this as a treatment rather than something that they are uh, knowing that they have to do to please whoever, their spouse, their friend, their parent, whoever, they're doing this for themselves and, you know, given the time and the coaching and the help, the resources, I find that people are very, very willing to make make the changes. Excellent. And those approaches, they sound very, very personalized and effective. Uh, and I agree, I wouldn't have been able to do keto. It, you almost forget that when you've been doing keto for so long um, that you that I wasn't able to do it intuitively. I followed... Um, I followed, uh, I, I was two to one for our daughter and um, 10 gram, uh, maximum carbohydrate limit. And we, we, we worked that out. We logged everything. We weighed everything and it was onerous. I did not know how many carbohydrates were in, um, onion, um, and, um, fruit surprised me and rice, pasta, et cetera, et cetera. We were, that was, we were completely happy that that was gone. That was fine. And she wasn't a big carb person, but yeah, it was not intuitive and um, sitting there working that out and then realizing that months later that had become intuitive. And then we, we knew what would make up and that, you know, we kind of looked back and laughed at some of the earlier mistakes we'd made, but making these keto casseroles and these keto spittatas and things like that, things that she just didn't enjoy anyway before keto <laughs> and um, really working hard on those and getting the macro macro spot on at two in the morning. And then it's like, not my food. I've never liked this. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, so yeah, I like, I like how your approach differs with different people, which brings me to um, how your work is split and who can work with you because you're long term with the Charlie Foundation, which is phenomenal. All of them, the different um, studies, the research, the different patient groups and the different work that you, you've put out and, and the books that you've authored as well. But also you run your private um, clinic, um, which might serve a different type of patient. It might be the diabetes. So, so who, who can, who can contact you and how? Yeah. So speaking of long-term, I have a lot of long-term clients. So my specialty really is rare genetic metabolic disorders. 
And um, there's a whole list of these that we know keto works really well for. And these tend to be very complex patients that have lots of things going on, possibly a feeding tube or even a breathing tube. Um, and I um, found myself really enjoying helping those people and kind of, you know, published about that and word got out. And so I get lots of referrals for people with rare disorders. And I'm able to say, okay, I've worked with this disorder with about 20 patients. Doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a rare disorder. And there's probably only a couple hundred in this country. Um, so I end up working with those people for a very, very long time. So some of these were babies and now they're adults, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'm still working with them. Um, so that's sort of my my pet project is to keep going on the rare genetic metabolic disorders. And then I will, I'll get other people that I'll, I'll free up some time um, to take them in. But I'm involved, both Denise and I mentor a group of ketogenic specialists. They're all nutritionists and we have a nurse and a, a keto coach. And um, when I get referrals, I often refer to somebody in the group who I know, you know, is working with. In fact, today I, I referred two people whose uh, um, children have depression and they're looking for someone to talk to. And I referred them both to Candy Richardson, who is one of our ketogenic specialists, because I know she's really passionate about working with that population. So that on charliefoundation.org, there is a um, list of ketogenic specialists. And I think if you just Google Charlie Foundation ketogenic specialists, the page will pop up and you can contact these people. They all have their email addresses. They all have websites and some of them are specialized, but that's a good place to go. My name is there too, but you'll see that my name um, is listed with rare genetic metabolic disorders. Okay, that, that makes sense. So you're out there tr developing the training, delivering the training, mentoring. So you're cascading this. You can't reach every patient. Um, goodness knows there's so many that need support. So this, this sounds like a, a really great way to cascade that. Are those, um, clinicians, are they, and dietitians and registered nutritionists, are they, um, uh, American based and Canada or are they international? They're American based, but they all work globally. They all have global patients. Okay, that's that's interesting. Okay, so they so people can pop on and find more information there. And yeah, that and when you say you work with metabolic, rare metabolic disorders, is that that um I mean, is there a short list? Is is it GLUT one, Drave? Yeah. Uh Nimmel and my myopathy, which has not ever been published. That's a muscle disorder. Um, I have some adults with mitochondrial dysfunction without a diagnosis, but it's a genetic disorder. So some of these are not listed in, in, in publications, but they somehow find me because I have published about, you know, specializing in rare genetic metabolic disorders. Um, you know, ideally, I'd like to have a castle and just let everybody in and cook for everybody. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> And I actually did that. I'd I did that with that. a group uh, <laughs> uh, recently, a group of five women who have anorexia nervosa. And we got a big old house and they all brought a sponsor and we all cooked together, ate together. And it was a study um, on women with anorexia nervosa who um, failed all of the treatments that were available. And we tried keto. And the other part of the research was they also had ketamine available to them, ketamine, which is... Um, and it infused medication. So that report is out and they actually had very positive results. Goodness, that sounds interesting because, um, well, because it's an area that needs uh, another option and also uh, ketogenic diets and low carb carbohydrate restriction has um, um, has been cited as potentially a problem um, for creating disordered eating. Um, so, so really great to see that work and that study. That sounds like it was fascinating. And you do get involved in lots of diverse, um, interesting studies. I think I've read about something, um, cancer certainly and Alzheimer's work is coming out to, to, um, various different mental health, uh, um, aspects. You mentioned depression. We touched on bipolar, but this, this, um, work coming out with schizophrenia, um, uh, so it, yeah, I think, you know, thanks to you and the platform and the tools that you've been creating, like the ketogen, the keto calculator and the, um, the books, but um, the recipes, all of, all of that work, all of that training development. I think we're in such, 
uh, an exciting time to see more people have a brighter future. So thank you for chatting with me and explaining your your work and a little bit more. Um, as a as a final um, word, would you, how would you say to people to set themselves up? It, it, what can give them? Because you've seen you've worked with so many different people and there's so many potential pitfalls. How how could somebody set themselves up really really well to to get started? Yes, uh, I'm glad you asked that because there's something I do with nearly every client that I work with, unless they have a specific disorder where we know that keto is just, you know, the go to therapy, but other people that I've, I've worked with who have maybe migraine headache or feel cognitively like they're just not thinking clearly and they're in their 30s, you know, they're already having issues. I usually start those people with just get rid of sugar and eat real food. So getting rid of sugar, step number one, and any food that has sugar added to it. And by the way, sugar substitutes too, because they really aren't that good for you either. So that's one big step. And then the next step is eat real food. Don't eat things that come out of a package or a wrapper. Eat real food. And if it does have a wrapper, because of course they do wrap things like vegetables and wrappers, make it only by the ones that are single ingredient, right? So walnuts would be in a package. Um, and that that's hard to do, but that's a very good step before going keto. And what I find is that people feel like uh, this was a big step. And you know what, I'm already feeling a difference in my health. I am having regular bowel movements. I'm waking up on time in the morning without pressing the snooze on my alarm. So that to me sometimes can be, you know, a, just the diet that they need is just to eat real food and get off of the junk, basically what I call the Franken food, um, because there's now plenty of research showing that our bodies weren't meant for those. We really weren't. And once you understand that and maybe um, talk about it with people and maybe feel it for yourself, it becomes easier to adopt a lifestyle where you know you're fueling yourself, you know, and, and think about what you feed a baby. Would you ever feed a baby candy or popsicles or anything with sugar? You would not ever do that. You would want that baby to have the best possible formula or baby food um, because you know that's baby's brain is growing quickly. Well, our brains also need that kind of treatment. We also are affected by everything we eat. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you, you said that. And uh, if for some people that I work with, for example, that aren't managing very, very serious health conditions, but just want some improvements, perhaps weight, perhaps the um, heading towards prediabetes or heading in or have just been uh, diagnosed with prediabetes or their children have um, some behavioral issues that they're concerned about, but they haven't got a diagnosis. Um, the results, the really honestly the impact that exactly what you're saying of cutting out those things and then we don't have to call it a specialized um low carbohydrate diet or it's a carbohydrate restriction or this diet or that diet we we're simply cutting out the inflammatories and the neuroexcitability foods basically the the ultra processed foods everything in a packet um so yes i i just have to echo that and and then that sets you up beautifully um, for your ketogenic diet, if you do need to try that as your therapy, as your as your medication, um, if that's going to be your your um, therapy, then this is a perfect way, and you'll feel more comfortable. You might even head off and not experience side effects if you um, if you take that approach. So, thank you. I think that's a really really great suggestion. And yeah, if you send those links, I'll, I'll pop those in. Um, so that people can look at some of those studies and, and see your, your work. But thank you so much for talking to me today, Beth. You're so welcome, Claire. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please make sure to subscribe. This really helps us to be able to create more content.